coming up on The Cost of Living. If you give people a new platform of a new food product with a new flavor, it's going to be scary. So familiar discovery is the idea that we can give someone something reasonably familiar um, and then just put a layer of novelty over top of it that makes it new and interesting. Uh, and they're more likely to buy it that way, more likely to enjoy it. Familiar discovery. It's like potato chips, only they're tangy tamarind flavor. And one place you're seeing this more? Fast food menus. Hi, I'm Paul Haverford. Welcome to The Cost of Living. a and is now offering a Piri Piri Potato Buddy Sandwich. It's a spicy, South Asian-inspired veggie burger. And it's the latest sign that fast food joints are realizing one size doesn't fit all. Also today, for the kids, what's old is always new again. In music, Brittany, Avril, Nelly Furtado, they're back, baby. And nostalgia doesn't stop there. The money advice from FinTalk, financial TikTok, is even more old school. Just like their grandparents, it's stuffing cash into envelopes. Up first, in a story that first aired earlier this year, we consider the advice of the Beatles, noted financial advisors that they were, who once sang, I don't care too much for money, cause money can't buy me love. So money can't buy love, sure. But what about happiness? We're getting philosophical today, Tracy Johnson. We are. Can money buy happiness? It's a big question. Yeah. Answer seems kind of obvious. Well, it does, and we kind of <laughs> did think that we... <laughs> <laughs> yes, done. <laughs> Let's move on. And we kind of thought we had an answer to this, but now we do have new research that is changing the way we think about money and happiness. This is a question people have been talking about for quite some time. About 15 years ago, a Nobel Prize winning economist, Daniel Kahneman, published a study that got a lot of attention at the time. You may have even heard about it. In the study, Kahneman showed that money does make you happy, but only up to a point. And that point is... $75,000 a year. That's in U.S. dollars. That's how much you need to make to cover stuff like food and shelter and just not worry about money all the time. Peter Drummond knows all about that. <laughs> yeah, I was barely broke. There were times where we were sleeping in cars when I was a kid and times that there was food scarcity. So that's probably the worst kind of, um, the, the, the biggest problem with poverty is for me anyway, was a lack of food. Being hungry sucks, <laughs> it's painful. And it's hard, I mean, it's hard to be happy when you're hungry. When he was growing up, Peter's mom, as he puts it, found loopholes in the credit system. So she would get on the wrong side of the law. That meant sometimes they'd have a lot of money, but then she'd go to jail, the family would lose everything. So back then. I was happy when I was poor, but I was in a lot of pain. And so what I would say is like, like, like when you're broke, the pain, frustration, and anger are all there. But like, I, I, I'm not someone who is allowed to feel other emotions <laughs> as a child. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the optionality for emotions was happiness and anger for the most part. So there were, it was always one of those two things. I was never like sad. I was never upset. I was always either happy or angry. <laughs> it's a tough way to grow up. And happiness researchers, they agree you do need enough money to meet your basic needs if you're trying to be happy. And once you do that, Kahneman's study found that making more money, it doesn't do much because your happiness hits a plateau. And he's a Nobel Prize winner, so people listen. In fact, one CEO in Seattle gave all of his employees a raise based on this research. As for Peter, he definitely got happier when he started making money. He was 18. He started doing door-to-door -door sales. He was good at it. And the money followed. As I get more money, the anger fades away because... There's no reason for it. He started making a lot. And the more money he made, the happier he got. So this blows up what Kahneman had argued, but it does support what the most recent happiness research said would happen. This research was done by a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. His name is Matt Killingsworth. And he found that more money makes you happier. 
So we have this happiness research smackdown. And the two professors, they decided to team up and figure out who is right and who is wrong. And they do agree on a bunch of stuff, like that happiness is made up of more than just one thing. There's your big picture life satisfaction. Are you feeling good about your job, your family, your life goals? And then there's how do you feel on the day-to-day, your emotional well-being. Right? Like we all have positive feelings, love, laughter, kind of ha-ha, good times. And we have negative ones, stress, anger, worry. So the big revelation in the first happiness study from 2010 was that many of your negative feelings go away at that $75,000 a year mark. But when those two academics went back at it, what they found was that the first research got one big thing wrong. It had surveyed thousands of people and asked, how are you feeling the day before? It asked questions like, did you smile or not yesterday? But those questions are not actually a good way to gauge happiness. So as it turns out, if you think about it, if you didn't smile at all the day before, that's not so much a measure of, you know, happiness or positive emotions. It seems to be more of a measure of negative emotions, right? Like if if the answer to the question of like, have you smiled at all yesterday is no, you're probably not doing so well. That's Kostadin Kushlev. He's a happiness researcher at Georgetown University. The guy behind the latest study, Killingsworth, went about things differently. He asked people in real time how they were feeling. He would actually ping their phones randomly during the day. And then people would answer him on a scale ranging from very bad to very good. And he found that happiness does keep going up as you make more money. Here's how Killingsworth explained it in an interview with NBC. As people earned more money, they felt more in control of their life. Uh, It's easy to imagine how if you have more money, you can, you know, you see organic raspberries in the grocery store and that's what you're in the mood for. So you buy it instead of buying, you know, a box of dried pasta. Or maybe if you are working in a job that you think is kind of unfulfilling, you can quit your job and you have sort of a financial cushion. Sort of in these very small ways and very profound ways, you can sort of steer your life in the direction you want a little bit more easily, uh, I think, when you have more resources. So more money can give you a bit more control over your life. And that can help cut down on your unhappiness, which leaves some more room to be happy. So is this it? Is this the answer to can money buy happiness? Not exactly. The relationship between income and happiness, regardless of how you define happiness, is very weak statistically. And so, you know, the difference between making, you know, 15,000 a year and 250,000, according to the latest data on on this 100 point scale of happiness is only five points, right? So imagine that. So yes, we can detect this, it's there, it's statistically significant, but is it practically significant? And do we want to organize our lives around, you know, earning more and more money? Because you have to work to make that money, and work is work. So what he is saying is that on a 100-point scale of happiness, money only accounts for five of those points. So yes, having more money does increase your happiness, but it's only by a little bit. And then there's another wrinkle. We aren't all the same. Right? There's something called the unhappy minority, which covers about 20% of people. And once they have enough money to meet their basic needs... Making more does not make them any happier. What the researchers say is, if you're rich and miserable, more money won't help. You'll still be miserable. Peter does not fall into that 20%. Uh, He was so good at sales, he joined a tech startup at one point, it sold, he cashed in, and now his annual income is like north of seven figures. Like a million bucks a year plus. (laughs) He is rolling And when he first started making money, like serious money, he did what you think a young guy might do. He splashed out on clothes. He went to clubs. He just, like, lived large. But did that kind of spending make him happier? Every experience you have, in some sense, depreciates the value of that category of experience. So, like, if you go on vacation a year, that feels amazing. If you go on, four, like, the fourth vacation in a year, it's going to feel less amazing than the first. The 10th or 12th is going to feel just less and less and less. So those, so if you keep buying vacations, because a lot of people tell me, well, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy travel. And it's like, I promise you that travel is going to be the exact same thing as shoes. <laughs> like the first pair, the first pair of Louboutins feels amazing. The 10th is just like, 
now it's just table stakes. Like that, like, like if you, like you need to go to Hermes or some other category now, and then that feels good. And then you buy 10 of those and then that's irrelevant. Right. And so the more of those experiences you buy, the less happy they make you. I would like to try out this theory just maybe over one year. The things you sacrifice for science, Tracy Johnson. <laughs> but you heard them. It's not going to help. Diminishing returns. Right. It's this idea called the hedonic treadmill, which is the more you have, the more you want, and the more you have, and the more you want, and on and on it goes. Right. And stuff, as Peter said, can't buy happiness. And happiness researchers, they agree with that. They say there is something that matters more. So what is the secret to happiness? In some ways, it's not a secret at all. Uh, we all know the answer to that. And the secret to happiness, and maybe some would argue to unhappiness, uh, is other people. As a happiness researcher, uh, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, right? Because when, once you say it, it's like, wow, is this, <laughs> you know, you, you have to research this. Like, we all know this intuitively, ultimately. But at the same time, uh, if you think about it, we do spend all this time, you know, pursuing these uh, goals, like including money goals, thinking that that's going to bring us a lot of happiness. And that is not the case. So he is saying that it's not money that buys happiness, but relationships, your family and friends chatting with the person you buy your coffee from, your coworkers. Are you saying I am the key to your happiness? I'm going to buy you a coffee, Paul. I will make me so very happy. <laughs> so you know what? Maybe money can't buy all the happiness, but getting those organic raspberries, Trace, hmm. it's pretty nice. Or flying business class. I would try that. <laughs> Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist who found that you needed $75,000 a year to reach peak happiness, died on March 27th at the age of 90. Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002, despite quite famously having never taken an economics class. On your Radio and by podcast, this is The Cost of Living. I'm Paul Habershrude. Your grandparents, they didn't have Excel spreadsheets. Household budgeting was old school. They sat at the kitchen table and balanced the checkbook or used cash. Now we can pay by debit, credit, online, tap our phones. We have every convenience under the sun. And yet, our producer Danielle Nerman says, far from being outmoded, some of the old ways are making a comeback. <laughs> Sasha Gray just paid off $35,000 in debt. I was so emotional <laughs> when it happened. I remember just submitting that last payment online and just crying. And it only took... 55 weeks, to be exact. If you're like, I'll have what she's having, get ready to throw your credit card in the freezer. Every two weeks, Sasha goes to the bank and withdraws her entire paycheck. Then she takes that stack of cash and divvies it up into 20 envelopes. Dining out is getting $75. My groceries envelope, I'm going to be putting $150. It's called cash stuffing. You only spend the money in your envelopes. Once they're empty, too bad, so sad. No more, skip the dishes. Having that budget and not overspending and just frivolously buying whatever the heck I want when I want, I had more money all of a sudden to put towards my debt. Last year, consumer debt in Canada reached $2.4 trillion, up 3% from the year before. That might explain why budgeting trends like cash stuffing are popping up on TikTok. Look at all this cash that I stored away instead of spending on unnecessary items. So I'll just count it with you. So I've got 20 40, 60. There are nearly 100,000 posts with the hashtag cash stuffing. And while this idea may be new to millennials and Gen Zs, it ain't new. So I don't want to say how, say how long I've been in this business, but that would be something I recommend way back in the early 90s. Lori Campbell is with the insolvency firm Doyle Saluski. She says cash stuffing is just a snazzy new name for old school budgeting. And if you're in over your head, it can get you back on track. 
but it's risky. I can understand how people think they need to compartmentalize their money so they don't overspend in one area, but there are so many amazing apps to do that. And there's so many dangers to running around with a bunch of cash in your pocket. Also, if you pay for everything with cash, you're not building a credit score. And I think if you're 20 or 21, maybe you're not thinking that far ahead, but you should be. You should be thinking about what happens in 10 years when you've been using cash for the last 10 years. And suddenly you're like, well, you know, maybe I should be looking at my future and buying a house. You're going to be a blank slate. And when, when a potential creditor goes to look up your information, there's nothing there. Lori says you also lose out on the perks that come with credit cards, like cash back, free flights, and loyalty points. But Sasha Gray feels she didn't have a choice. Being so deep in debt meant she had to stop using her credit card. The points didn't matter at that point because I couldn't trust myself. Now she only pays with plastic when she absolutely has to, like when she books a flight online. And what Sasha loses by not collecting credit card points, she more than makes up for as an influencer. Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. For those of you- She's Canadian girl cash stuffer on YouTube. I had somebody comment, I think just yesterday, saying that they started cash stuffing because of me and they're almost debt free. So it's pretty cool to see that other people are doing something that they see I'm doing and they've had success with it. What I thought I would do today is sit down with you and work out exactly what I do every single time I get paid. So I wanna walk you- For the cost of living, I'm Danielle Nerman. Put up your hand if you know exactly what goes into a Big Mac. Two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. McDonald's has been making it the same way since the 60s. Order a team burger at a &W, you know how it's gonna taste. A Whopper at Burger King, boom. Fast food joints have built empires on the idea that you know what you're getting. But now, Paula Dehachik, they're mixing it up. Today's fast food is not the fast food we grew up with. Well, yeah, right? Like you can get a chicken wrap, a salad, and iced coffee. Yeah, but what's happening now goes way beyond a breakfast sandwich. Fast food restaurants are doing all kinds of work trying to keep up with customers and figure out the next thing that people are going to want. So we're talking like the McRib. Mm -hmm, exactly, because there's new restaurants all the time and these companies got to stay ahead of the competition. I went to Vancouver and I got to go behind the scenes at A&W. And Paul, this is where the magic happens. The test kitchen where all their new products are born. Like this would be a good example of how we ensure consistency because now the potatoes will not move around. If you put them in an open fryer, you could have inconsistent frying. But this way is it kind of locks in and it stays like that. Karan Suri is showing me how they make a perfectly cooked hash brown. He spent years working at luxury hotels in Kenya, India, Saudi Arabia, but today he's the guy whose job it is to come up with new ideas for the A&W menu. Like, what kind of stuff? Well, right now, the big thing in fast food is spicy everything. Not so much that vinegary, hot saucy kind of spicy that was big a few years ago. Nowadays, it's all about these different kinds of spicy from all over the world. So this is a creamy chili crisp. That's David Yoy, Karin's co-pilot in the test kitchen and a food scientist by training. Next up from a very different part of the world, this is a Moroccan hot pepper aioli. As well as with the peppers, you'll have a lot of warming spices. Thank cumin, cinnamon, coriander. You know, when I think A&W, I don't immediately think like cinnamon coriander. <laughs> How do they know if they make that kind of thing that it's going to play? Some of it's science, some of it's art. They work with companies who feed them tons of data forecasting what people are into now and what they're going to want to eat five years from now. But inspiration can also be a lot more spontaneous. Karen is notorious for sending these late night text messages like the time he was on TikTok and discovered Pickle Talk. It was about 1 a.m. on a Wednesday night and he texted me a TikTok and he said, there's something here. And it was a, uh, a TikTok video of the pickle girl trend. He said, I think we can do a sauce with this. And so the next day we, we got in, we went to the grocery store, we bought, we bought a bunch of ingredients and we started making pickle-based sauces. Five weeks later, we had uh, fully completed with our supplier a spicy dill pickle aioli. 
So he went from watching Pickle Talk on TikTok, and like a month and a bit later, he had a new dip? Yeah, and incidentally, that is thought to be the fastest they've ever come up with a new recipe. Huh, well, how long can it take? That record goes to a spicy chicken glaze that took two and a half years and 57 different recipes. So that is a lot of attempts, Paula. Like, what were they trying to do? Just get the glaze perfectly glazy? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah, but that's not the only challenge. It's one thing to make a recipe when you're a trained chef who has all the time in the world, but it is another thing to mass produce it. And there's just a difference between the way I can whisk up a sauce and a, a gigantic machine that's making literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands of liters of this. So it needs to be, it needs to work in those very, very tough kitchen environments. So it needs to work and it also needs to be repeatable, right? Like everyone needs to be able to make the same thing over and over in spots across the country. Yeah, no, people want to know that if they get a burger in Vancouver, if they get one in Halifax, it's going to be the same burger. And when they're looking for inspiration, they're not just getting it from TikTok. They get it from all over the place, including their own customers. Their latest limited time offer is a Piri Piri burger with a spicy sauce and a potato patty. It's actually based on a menu hack. A franchise owner in Mississauga noticed a lot of South Asian customers were ordering burgers and subbing a beef patty for a hash brown. I'm from India and there's a big, big population of vegetarian folks there and don't eat meat, don't eat chicken, but we have hash browns. So they were making, kind of inventing this off-menu hash brown sandwich and now it's actually on the menu? Yeah, they're trying it out. All right, but what about the idea of standardization? Like fast food chains were built on standardization, they were built on efficiency, repeatability. And the test kitchen does think a lot about that. What can you make in these very standardized, small kitchens? But these chains also know they have to keep up with the times. Demographics are changing. That means tastes are changing. And a lot of customers these days are new Canadians. They come with their own flavors and their own cultures and their own cuisines. And I think the challenge that lies is how do you blend the two and how do you come up with something that is that doesn't alienate your existing Uh, guests, uh, actually excites them, but then it starts giving uh, familiarity to the new demographic to come and try these things, right? Okay, yeah, but how do they do that? Like, how do they give people something that they know, but at the same time also something that is new? Well, there's actually a term for that. Derek Vela runs the University of Guelph's Food Innovation Center, and he calls it familiar discovery. So familiar discovery is the idea that we can give someone something reasonably familiar um, and then just put a layer of novelty over top of it that makes it new and interesting. uh, And they're more likely to buy it that way, more likely to enjoy it. So basically, these restaurants are trying to do two things at the same time. On the one hand, appeal to new customers with different tastes. On the other hand, create a bit of excitement for their existing customers. Yeah, they need to keep people coming through the door, right? Like, that's the game. Yeah, fast food restaurants have been doing a pretty good job of that. But Vince Scabaloni, a food industry analyst with Circana, says business is getting more competitive. Paula, the stakes are getting higher because we are in a slower growth environment now with the economic situation. So if the brands want to grow, they're going to have to steal customers from somebody else. And burger chains aren't just competing against other burger chains anymore. He says they're also competing against newcomers, places like Osmo's Shawarma and Thai Express. Right now, we're seeing growth in quick service restaurants beyond the big legacy brands that we all know and love and have grown up with. It's the smaller operators and even some of the independents who are growing. And they tend to serve more globally inspired cuisine. There is a lot of chains out there serving healthy-minded foods. And these are the foods that aren't necessarily available from the traditional operators that we're all familiar with. Well, yeah, if you're a burger joint right now, you're going up against everyone from Chipotle to Jollibee. Yeah, there's a lot of choices out there right now, and we're getting more of them all the time. Vince says right now we're in a bit of a fast food renaissance. During the pandemic, a lot of restaurants had to close their test kitchens. They trimmed their menu back to the essentials to kind of save money. But now we're seeing restaurants roll out a lot more of these special limited edition burgers and sandwiches. A&W, for instance, is currently developing around 70 different products. So that test kitchen you went to, it is busy. Yeah, I mean, probably only a few of those will actually make it into a restaurant. Well, what would you want to see? Like, if you had your druthers, if you could pick and say, this is going to be the next big thing, what would Paula want to eat? 
I mean, I would love to see more products incorporating Cool Ranch flavor. Like Cool Ranch aioli dip burger shawarma? Yeah, Doritos meets fast food fusion. Love it. I think it's a winner. (laughs) Thanks, Paula. Thank you. That's all for this week. The Cost of Living is based in Calgary. The show is produced by Daniel Nerman, Ellis Cho, and Jennifer Keene. With help from Caroline, the fighting Easter Bunny Ferris. Our executive producer is Tracy Johnson. I'm Paul Haversrude. Thanks for listening. <laughs>